<lacht> Showtime. <lacht> Welcome to the Post World Podcast, recorded at Karlmark Studios Bunker, somewhere hidden in Berlin. I'm Pablo Deneri, your host, and today's guest is Malcolm Green, dancer, visual artist, publisher, sound artist, etc., etc. Hi, Malcolm. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> inviting me. Right. What would you answer when someone asks, what do you do? What is the first thing you would say? A bit of everything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Whatever takes my fancy, um, no particular direction, except if I bite my teeth and set my teeth into something, then I'll go for it for quite a while. But generally, I like to change. And when they ask, what, what do you are? What kind of artist do you are? What do you answer? Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I, don't, I don't know if I could actually... I thought probably I'm a Sunday conceptualist, you know. Uh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, But I'm, I'm obviously, I have deep roots in sort of the bright psychedelic era that I grew up in and from pop art and that sort of stuff. And uh, I mean, I think one friend of mine said that, that was sort of my combination was sort of somewhere between pop and fluxus. But I'm, I'm, not, right. a, I'm not a big fluxus fan, but I think it's probably a, a good way of looking at it. Right. I ask, I know it's a kind of a tricky question because you come from this background where exactly there was a multiplicity of activities or this uh, it was when it started in a way the post-war um, movements that were kind of uh, inventing new um, shapes of what authorship or what a work of art would be and also having this multiplicity of activities not just doing painting but also sound but also I don't know maybe media art or happening performance and that's why I ask because I know in a way for you it would be impossible to s just say one thing mm. Um, mm. how do you trace this uh, story let's say to the beginning <laughs> it's, it's funny because while you were saying that I was tracing it back and I suddenly made a new connection actually I think yeah. when I was a little kid you know I used to kind of pick up bits of iron and stuff on the street because we lived on an uh, unmade up road and I tucked them away so that my mother didn't actually sort of see what I was doing there and you know, it was all kind of secretive but I just sort of loved the weight of old bits of rusty big nails and, and things for road construction and so mm -hmm. on And I think later on, I mean, I've always picked up stuff. Um, I, I mean, I've never actually really used it as art, but it's just sort of it, it intrigues me, sort of like stuff that um, is unusual. Bottle tops sometimes, if they've got not nice, something attracts me or broken things, thrown away things. Hmm. Um, and I think one of the first artworks I ever made, you know, I used to be a kid and we used to travel for free on the train where I was, and we used to, a gang of us, get on the trains and pull the seats back because you could actually lift the whole seat up. There was just like seats for four or five people. And we would try and find money because people would drop money behind these seats and sometimes we'd, we'd find money. <laughs> and I remember picking up this Coca-Cola bottle. And it was an old, old Coca-Cola bottle, bottle. And it was just like covered in filth and grime. And I took this home and I thought this was really exciting. And then I collected... I was burning joss sticks, so I must have been about 14, you know, these incense sticks. Yeah. And so I collected all of the incense. I just would burn incense, and the end of the sticks would fall into this bottle. And then I put all my nail clippings in there as well. And then, that, and then when it was finished, you know, there was a point where it was just full. And that was, that was for me, the, like, the first artwork that I did when I was about 14. Oh. It's very interesting. I thought you were starting to tell from when you were dancing, or, uh, <laughs> but you traced it back. Um, very interestingly to when you were a kid. Yeah. Because I think that's this found object kind of uh, thing was something that then was very common in art or was introduced to the art world. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember, so certainly I, I was interested in visual art uh, at an early stage. My mother would take me to see exhibitions. Um, I remember seeing, seeing the big Goya exhibition, the Miro exhibitions in London you know, when I was in my early teens, embarrassing mm. my mother in front of a Miro painting called Figure in, Sun in, in Front of a Pile of Excrement and saying, <laughs> what's excrement, mama? <laughs> and stuff like this. But, uh, so uh, He was preparing you for <laughs> Arte Povera. And so. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Very uh, interesting. Yeah, so... Um, 
And then, you know, the, the, then there were the, the color supplements that came in the 60s. That was like every Sunday there was a big sort of newspaper. There were two newspapers, Sunday Times and The Observer, and they would have a color magazine. I mean, the sort of thing you get now, you know, all the time. But that was very, very new. And there were a lot of creative energy went into this. And I remember seeing, like, Andy Warhol, a whole article on Andy Warhol, mm-hmm. there were, there, and, and looking up out of a manhole cover with, with ultraviolet, I think it was, with hmm. sort of silver-white hair, she as well. And somehow I connected this activity with the bottle. Mm-hmm. With Andy Warhol, but I mean, I think it was completely ridiculous. But I, I thought I was, I was channeling Andy Warhol in my rather <laughs> foolish way. I think you know, it was a kind of uh, vision. It was a hope, perhaps. <laughs> 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 and uh, then uh, you started to have a proper education, let's say, like art education. No, I went. No. I went to university. I, I finished my school. I went to university, and I did three years studying psychology. Oh, okay. Um, that I'm, explains some things. I it's, think. It might explain a lot, yeah, because yeah. I was I was sort of destined originally for the sciences, and uh, I originally went to do um, zoology and botany, which I thought were beautiful, but I'd done it so well at school that I just got to the university and was bored because I knew it all. <laughs> so I looked around and I thought, well, I'll do psychology, you know, and um, which was okay. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I'm glad in a way I did it. it. It sort of gave me a basis for understanding a lot of having a scientific. Education was. I can bet for sure. It's not. It's not a bad yeah. thing to have. Yeah. So you started painting while studying psychology. Then I d- I'd always painted as a kid. Actually, uh, I had exhibitions. You know, stuff in exhibitions, junior art circles and stuff like that. When in my hometown, South End, um, and at school, actually, they wanted me to do the exams in painting and art, but uh, my parents decided they didn't want me to be an artist so, and, <laughs> and they stopped that. I didn't realize I had only heard this about many years later. Um, yeah, and so actually painting seriously was while I was at university hmm. and in fact all of my friends were in the art department. Of course. You know, it just happened. It, the, first, <laughs> the first person I really actually talked to You know, I mean, there are a lot of people you just sort of say hello to and I oh, yeah, and what are you doing and that sort of. But the first person I suddenly sort of mm-hmm. said, ah, right, was Alistair. Now, Alistair Brocci, my colleague from Atlas Press. So we were both 18, you know, and we both suddenly discovered we liked the same sort of books. And um, that's how the whole Atlas Press thing came, which we may talk about later. Nice. And, you know. Yeah. And so I started painting then. And I think actually as I left that university, to go to the next university. I, I was started to Nottingham. To Nottingham. I was going to do a master's degree, but that sort of didn't happen. Hmm. Um, then I was painting quite quite seriously. And then I did my ballet training, because I then decided during this period of youthful confusion that I was <laughs> going to become a dancer, which was a very good decision, actually. Hmm. So, um, I th- yeah, I must have been... I was doing art then, and then I, when I went to London, I was doing much more art. That's right, because I moved in in a in a warehouse space in London while I was at the, the Dance Academy in London, hmm. and I just had a studio there, and I was doing dance during the day and painting during the evening. And Sounds so, very cool. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> But you also travelled a lot dancing, no? Travelled a lot. Well, I, I, for on the one hand, that I actually moved every two years from one job to the next, which I thought was actually quite interesting, quite good. It wasn't really sort of planned that way, but it just happened. And we went on tours, sure, you know, we went to... I mean, nothing madly exotic, I suppose, but sort of Belgrade and um, Berlin at that time. And um, oh, we went to Canada. I was in an ensemble in Heidelberg and dancing for a guy called Hans Kresnik, the, the choreographer, quite a famous man. And we actually were Germany's contribution to the World Expo in Vancouver in 1980, something or other, okay. at the beginning. So that was kind of fun. And, yeah. And uh, giving a, a grand reception with Einstein and a Neubauten as well. Nice. <laughs> Now I understand some of your music. Also. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And the music started quite early as well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Amazing. And uh, the master's degree you, you were doing was now 
in art or still psychology? No, it was in psychology. It was wow. in social, social psychology, yeah. Ah, social psychology. Social psychology, okay. yeah. yeah. But it was very theoretical, actually. I was, I was quite, in, quite interested in changing the whole kind of, just, just, what is it, putting the, the rudder, I can't remember what the expression <laughs> is, um, of the boat and changing the course of psychology. Because it was a period where psychology didn't quite know where it was going. It was mm. still locked in, in a very kind of experimental and very um, positivist direction. Yeah. And uh, quite Not a progressive, f- let's say. Yeah, quite a few of us were very frustrated with what we were studying. Right. And uh, I don't think I made a very good impression with my <laughs> efforts to, to, to change things, but I, I tried in my, yeah. little, my way, you know. You rebel to your parents in the end, like uh, making art. Yeah, but actually, because I did the the, the dance thing, you know, that was yeah. a strange step because yeah. um, I think they kind of realized that psychology wasn't really what I should be doing in my life. But it, it seemed to them, I suppose, in a way sensible. And then I sent them this letter and said, well, you know, actually, I'm, going to, I'm chucking psychology. I'm going to become a dancer. I don't know what you think about that, but um, <laughs> I'm going to do it regardless. Yeah. It's like becoming a DJ or something and traveling the world, like choosing something that is not logical. <laughs> something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But they had always liked ballet and they yeah. kind of, uh, they said, well, great, actually, you know, uh, we think you've decided on something that suits you and that means Because something Because it was tra- something traditional in a way. It was not contemporary dance. Well, I, t- I, tra- I trained very traditionally, but I think that's quite okay. I mean, even when I was doing really kind of crazy um you know, dragging wardrobes across the stage and sort of... What were you doing? Dragging wardrobes across the ah, stage. Okay. And, you know, just sort of like uh, working with uh, chainsaws and, and, you know, yeah. this sort of stuff, kind of, uh, getting covered in dirt from head to foot. And, so and, it was experimental. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. At the very beginning, I was just doing legs up and pretty dancing, you know, but then it got sort of... Yeah. I found, I found my métier. That was, that was, that was it. And don't you think uh, social psychology gave you tools for li- the little bit I studied from social psychology, for example, it really helped me understand dynamics on elements that exist in contemporary art, for example, relations to symbolism or to divinatory practices that you can understand them from outside the magical thinking and how they operate in reality without having to believe, let's say, in divinatory aspect of tarot and so. Mm -hmm. And in this way, I think social psychology, but it's also uh, something that changed a lot during the 90s, I think, and the 2000s, you know, it got more progressive and, yeah. Yeah, I'm talking 70s, and I think I would like to have done your course and not mine. I think so too, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) The contemporary art teacher was giving us tarot classes, so. (laughs) Yeah, we we were doing things like the glasses effect, you know, like uh, when a person's wearing glasses, uh, they are immediately rated as being five points more intelligent than people. No. This sort of stuff, you know, it was crazy. Completely like st- criminalistic, like uh, the shape of your brain. Well, <laughs> not quite as bad as that, but it was pretty, <laughs> it was pretty tough. Yeah. And so what would you do? Why did you stop dancing? Why did I stop dancing? Yeah, or did you stop dancing? Yeah, I stopped dancing full time when I was uh, mid-30s. And I think, you know, I'd done sort of, I'd been involved in dance for 14, something like 14 years. And I just thought it's time to sort of move on, grow up, actually. <laughs> I mean, I was fed up with uh, a situation where the, the director of the theatre, he would uh, call us Du in German, you know, this familiar form. Yeah. And we had to say Z to him, you know. And then we were doing political theatre, uh, apparently, on the stage. And I just thought, what? This is this shit. You know, this is a crazy mixed-up situation. Political you know. theatre in which sense? Yeah, because the themes that Hans Kresnik was working on, you know, it was like about how society, cruel society, is. it was very sort of um, a rough-and-ready formula that he used. Uh, strong images, but, you know, the actual sort of ideas behind it were the political ideas. I mean, he called himself a communist, um, and was calling for change in, in society. But, I mean, he, he would depict 
lives of kind of victims. It was always victims. It's people like Sylvia Plath or um, Frida Kahlo, or, or these kinds of characters. That was kind of one of the ways he would work, was would take a famous person and sort mm-hmm. of show what shitty life they had and, you know, how society could have should have been better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got a bit disillusioned with this, and I think perhaps that's another reason why I stopped when I was... In my you didn't like the um, solemnity of it? I just didn't think it was very... It wasn't fine enough for me. It wasn't... It wasn't post-war, post-war enough. Yeah, it wasn't... <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't working with his ideas through very nicely. He'd get tremendous visual sort of imagery, which he could put on stage, and, and also choreograph- choreographically yeah. he would uh, often do very, very wonderful things. But I just, you'd look at the pieces and you think, well, actually, what's it about? You know, does he know what, what this person really did? Right. Well, the you communist uh, uh, regime had, uh, or the artists during the communist regime, they had a very specific sense of obligation to uh, the cause and the party that was uh, above a, a, any aesthetic, uh, I think, um, work so um, there might be some kind of inheritance from that I guess well he was an Austrian I think he was just you know I think he he grasped actually a very very vivid expressive uh, and progressive language that he he used on the stage it wasn't in any way what you would call a a traditional or Hmm. you know But yeah, there was a sort of a, a, a dichotomy there that that I sort of that didn't keep me going. I could have kept going. I could have, you know, because I was very good at actually sort of playing odd characters and stuff like that, and was fairly sort of uncaring about what I looked like on stage, you know. So that was that was kind of quite useful. Liberating, or, you know, yeah. and uh, but I and then then what happened actually was Alistair, who I mentioned earlier. Yeah came back and said, look, Malcolm, you know, remember those books we used to talk about? And I said, yes. And he said, well, how about doing a little sort of anthology with me? Um, and perhaps you can find some stuff in from, by German writers. And he gave me a list of a few th- people that he thought of. And have a look through. And by that time, I was, I was reading German quite fluently. Um, have a look through and see if you can find some stuff that you would suggest you know could translate for us and let's let's see what happened off our you know so we did one anthology and then we did two and then three and then i launched into conrad Bayer, the austrian writer i don't know if you've come across him but for me one of the great post-war writers uh, there is ever you know and i, I remember finding this book. many many books from him published in your We've we've done three actually. Yeah, we've managed to <laughs> actually the whole complete works is only about that big, so we managed to make three books out of it. <laughs> we, but we've covered most of the good, really good stuff. And, you know. But until that time, have you been involved in publishing? Not at all. No. Not at all. I was still dancing when Conrad Bayer came out. I remember sort of like going into the theatre and holding it up and showing my colleagues and saying, "Look, I've done this. I've done this." You yeah, know? <laughs> it's terrific. Because it was different, completely different from what you were, were doing. Yeah, but actually, the colleagues that I had, you know, there were there were people there that had university educations as well. There were people went on became cameramen and and quite different things. It was it was quite a sort of interesting mixture of people. You know, it wasn't purely sort of. Um, I mean. It, a lot of us were, you know, we had gone, had gone through ballet school and not known what was going on in the world outside because, you know, when you're doing your training, you've got enough to cope with. But um, I think people, yeah, intelligent people had their eyes open, so that was good. So, but I'm, I'm drifting away here. And then actually what happened was um, we were sharing a flat, you know, one of those flat sharing situations and someone who, who came for a court, short while she was working in a marketing research company and they said oh you translate well we're looking for someone to do some translation so I said I said okay you know fair enough and then I just sort of discovered that I could do this really easily and they were paying me an enormous amount because you knew you knew well um German were you translating? Yeah, I kind of, I'd kind of got the, 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 the basic idea of translation, doing mm. this crazy Atlas Press stuff, you know, really mad writers. And then I was, I was doing 
stuff about cars, actually. So I had to kind of learn very quickly. I bought some car magazines and I bought a car dictionary. Did you know anything about cars? I don't like cars, but you know. I also don't like cars. <laughs> <laughs> very funny. I also don't like cars. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's okay. So um, you had to learn... I had to learn stuff, yeah, and I, I set up my own sort of dictionary on my computer, you know, and and because uh, in that time we were, uh, I was learning how to use a computer, learning, you know, getting the very first computer, getting the first fax, which cost fourteen hundred marks, <laughs> you know, it's just crazy. I didn't even know. know what that was worth. <laughs> yeah, but it was. Well, th think in terms of fourteen hundred euros, you're talking about, right? Just a, wow. Yeah, but. But, you know, I was getting this lot of work in and people were saying to me things like, thank you very much. Wow, that's great. And I thought, well, hang on, I haven't heard this in a long time because <laughs> that wasn't happening in the theatre where I was working. You know, people didn't. Say I mean, the last day when I left that theatre, because I realised I had a future somewhere else. I mean, it was a hard decision, but um, no one really said goodbye. I just packed my bags and, and walked out, and that was it. So in a different con context, you might have uh, uh, kept doing dance, maybe. I think, well, certainly if I hadn't had this new idea, you know, and I don't know if I knew what, quite what I, was, I wanted to do, where I wanted to, that to take me, uh, but I liked the idea of the freedom, and I had this... this Longing, actually, for many years, because obviously the theatre season goes from September through to June, July, something like that. And I always wanted to go to Crete in the early spring when it's green. And so like the first year I was out of the system, I went to Crete in the spring. It was fantastic, you know. Right, because you didn't have time with the practices. It, and stuff. Of course, no. Yeah. And, um, and editorial, editorial life was, uh, did you have more free time to go to Crete? Yeah, I had, I had the time. I had the possibility to just to say, "Oh, I'm not working this week. See ya." And uh, you know, I would send a little. I would tell. You, I think there was no emails at that point, but <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? There was a time yeah. where there was no before emails. the internet. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know. And so, but you have a lot of background in literature, and you certainly chose, or you were part of the decision of choosing a very. Um, let's say, subjacent story of literature that has to do with maybe non-writers, but artists from the avant-garde from the last century. Well, we started off very much actually with writers, and it was only later that we sort of started to introduce more uh, avant-garde okay. writing, yeah. So, like, as I was saying, I mean, I... I was very keen on doing the, the Vienna group, which was Artman and, and Conrad Bayer in particular. Mm. Uh, I, quite a lot of Austrians turned up, Wolfgang Bauer, you know, just stuff that I liked. Yeah. Um, Albert Ehrenstein, just sort of, and it was always this sort of enthused writing, writing off, I suppose what you'd say, off the wall, but I mean, that's a hackneyed expression, but, mm. but crazy, um, Zustands, Bedingtes, Schreiben, you know, where you, you just know the guy was on something when he was writing it, or um, uh, writing in extremes. I mean, I, I've been very proud and glad to, to do the, the Unica Zorn books, um, which are not all just uh, written after phases of, of her uh, psychiatric treatment, but um, some of it's some of it very light and very sort of. Yeah. Wonderful, but uh, also she was the um, the wife of a surrealist. That's uh, right. She was well, the the the, the, the partner, a partner of Han Par Hans Bellmer. Yeah, yeah. So Hans Bellmer, we, we I also did, which I thought was a terrific thing to do. So that's that's where you start finding the writer artists, okay. which actually I think started in a way was well, that's a new, uh, transition when we, when we did the Dada Almanac. The Dada Almanac was the first, I think, where we really went that way. And then I did the writings of the Vienna Actionists, which was a very beautiful book, very exciting. And these projects took years, literally. You know, this was, I think, before I could actually get all the rights and hmm. convince all the people we should do it on the on the uh, Vienna Actionist book, you know, yeah. like uh, managers of one particular artist who, who who did everything he could to try and stop us. 
Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. But the artist in question, uh, that's Gunter Bruce, sort of realized we were doing something okay. and, and um, Because of the authors you were publishing? Or? Not at all, really. I think he was just jealous, you know. He just wanted to have his hands on everything and didn't want other people to be using... Was this uh, located in England? The uh, Atlas Press? At Atlas Press is in yeah. London, yeah, that's right, yeah. And I was... Because that was very convenient that I could actually tour around these countries. I mean, I was living in Heidelberg most of that time. So I could get on a train to Austria, you know, very quickly, or Switzerland when I started. When we did the, the topography of chance, that was because mm. I worked then with, with Dito Hort very closely. And, uh, and I like that uh, from the perspective of uh, thinking, history, philosophy, You also have a lot of authors that are or were part of the tradition of the cursed or the... Of the which? Cursed. cursed. The cursed? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like to say Bataille yeah, sure. or Baudelaire. Or, right, Baudelaire you don't have, but uh, um, let's say this tradition uh, by what well, they were, the antis in a way. Well, we uh, called the, 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 the whole thing um, the anti-classics. Hmm. had a special you know, series, right. yeah. So I think... That's right. So, the, in fact, they're classics of anti-classic, <laughs> as it were. And, uh, gosh. So, but because this is a very uh, unique um, a point when you study philosophy or when you study uh, art, avant-garde, and so, um, uh, I, I happen to also uh, go down this hole Of, uh, reading Nietzsche and then uh, Foucault and then uh, Baudelaire sure. and all the darkies in a way mm, and mm, uh, kind mm. of this new existentialism. I don't know how this is called from literature or from philosophy, but this was... Um, um, oh, so post-structuralism and then onwards, isn't it? Of a, of a, of but it's pre-existential, I don't know. But yeah. um, a lot of these authors... Um, in, in, uh, had a lot of influence in the f uh, first, the beginning of the 20th century uh, movements also. And this is where, where the line between art and literature and other disciplines and so started to mix in a way. Yeah, I mean, we, we also noticed that our readers, um, I mean, we had have had a lot of contact with our readers, you know, and they come to openings and launches and, and write and you know, a lot of artists, art school kids, and then a lot of musicians, actually, you know, that's the sort of um, two strongest, I think, uh, areas that I would, I would name first of all. Hmm. So um, why is it? That's, a, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Why is it these sorts of people that uh, are looking for Ways of thinking that are not normally charted, that are charted that are not normally sort of handed down. Um, hmm. People that are interested in very ambiguous, ambivalent situations or possibilities of uh, perhaps trying to think two things at the same time. <laughs> Literally, you know, and, yeah. and and this way or being in between genres or, or traditions or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of this, that what you're talking about, I, I think, you know, like the Bataille stuff mm. and, and so on, that's thanks to Alistair. He's done an enormous amount of very, very great research there. Uh, I think my contributions were, okay, the, the Vienna Actionist stuff and mm. um, and the doll from, from Hans Bermer, which is the most extraordinary work, which I can <laughs> only re recommend, except it's completely sold out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> You, you can still recommend it. I can still recommend it. You could get it in the library. I you think, generate you know. the need for the product. I know. think everybody <laughs> should write a letter to Alice Press and say, hey, you know. You also have um, authors that write about these uh, characters, like Klosowski, for example. I remember reading Klosowski on Nietzsche and so on. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, what some would call like a libertarian also line of um, philosophy or thinking, these authors. for Certainly for me... Uh, When I was at school, this was one of the special places uh, uh, I got um, in relation of the way they were writing, the tone. It was a very interesting time, like change of words. And 
Um, yeah, I think it's. Um, yeah, I, th- I think also yeah, a lot of these these philosophers that I I, I like and, and and read as well, they're often very kind. If you take a little thing from another philosopher, or it's an interview or something, it's it's always sort of a dialogue dialogic way of thinking, which I think is very important. Hmm. And this anti-tradition, let's say, would be the the norm in this. Uh, yeah, side. I mean, there's a lot of anti to to be <laughs> done in in Great Britain because you know they still don't review translations and books by f- foreign. I, I mean, there are exceptions, but I mean, it's so few and far between. And uh, I was going through letters the other day from from Richard Shepherd, who was the, the great Dada researcher in Oxford, mm-hmm. and. Uh, you know, he was saying it's it's, it's a shame. Uh, our British seem to like their literature straight. <laughs> you know, it is I, a shame. Yeah. And I, I just had to really laugh. You know, and he wrote that okay, maybe fifteen years ago, twenty years ago, but it's it's. it's but when it was dated, uh, yeah, it would have been in sort of in the eighties, I think. Or okay. Basically. Yeah, but you know, it was just it's actually longer, isn't it? Yeah, shit, but. Um, but that was what we were fighting against, you know, the, the complete non-knowledge in the UK about literary surrealism. And what we were completely interested in doing was not writing books about surrealism, but actually publishing books of what the surrealists themselves had said and written, and the Dadaists and the Vienna Actionists and so on. I mean, the Vienna Actionists was a, a case in point. Uh, when I sort of embarked on that project... There was a very wonderful exhibition, touring exhibition, and there were two enormous thick books that came out documenting the actions and so on. But at the end of it, you just sort of thought, well, ah, great, but what did they actually do? You know, what was what were the actions? Huh? A lot of sort of great ideas about what they might have been doing or something. Yeah. But, and so I just sort of said, well, you know, we've got to do all of their scores and their... There, and what they actually wrote in their handouts and this sort of stuff and 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 their reflections and hmm. their own publications and that's what we did. And, uh, Foucault calls it uh, the style of research, genealogy. It's yeah. a research, the research in which you try to get to how this person at this moment interpreted the same words, you know, or how they perceived reality. Um, which is a very difficult task because it's very multidisciplinary um, and so. Yeah, I mean, I found it very interesting, for instance, we actually reprinted then um, some of the things that they had printed by other people in their magazines, which were sort of like uh, people absolutely incensed by the the actionists and saying they should be sort of have their pricks cut off and this sort of stuff. And, and <laughs> you just think, wow, this is so extraordinary because these are the, exactly the themes that they are working on you know uh yeah. and and people come back with it as an insult as an attack well for the surrealists this would be a win because they wanted to generate a scandal well i think this is was exactly for the actionists as well you know i mean they were in a way d- diffusing a lot of bad energy that was going on in that it was it was channeling into them <laughs> and, and, and they were just getting rid of it you know yeah 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 and so yeah and so it was a kind of a hall of mirrors you know the actionists had done something. People had then scandalized, written... Creating cre- the actionists. Cre- <laughs> recreating yeah. the actionists. And then the actionists had published these as part of their publications. And then we took it and did, uh, you know... Yeah, it's totally so meta. <laughs> it was wonderful, yeah. yeah. Now it's uh, it's on fashion, the word meta, because of the new um, as in me- Facebook project. Meta- it's called meta. As in metastasa, right? As in me- yeah. <laughs> But I like that everyone's saying, like, talking about meta interpretations or things or meta level of things. It's like go to uh, popular culture in a way. Of course, I understand this also means that maybe the world is no longer useful for <laughs> studying yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is why pataphysics, isn't it? It's, it's beyond metaphysics. Okay, now, yeah, so we yeah. have to call it, we have to have a pata Facebook. <laughs> right. Uh, actually, you you published the so-called inventor of pataphysics, creator of pataphysics, that is Alfred Jarry. We've done a lot, yeah. Mm. Um, you have a lot published from him. And regarding like this genealogy kind of research. There are also books about 
what Alfred Jarry would um, like the library of Alfred Jarry, <laughs> what Alfred Jarry would read, and so and find these very these books very interesting. You know, and what would he have read? Or what he would read now, or what? <laughs> no, what uh, what what uh, actual books ah, Jarry yeah. had in ah, yeah, his yeah. library? Yeah, but isn't it always interesting by writers? I think you know. Hmm. Um, it's my great regret that certain people that I've known, you know, we've never, there's no list of what they had in their libraries. I, yeah. Uh, Dieter Roth, I would very much like to have had a list of all the books in his library, you know. Right, you are um, you are a member of uh, Dieter Roth uh, Academy. That's great, yeah. yeah. And you work in uh, honoring his legacy and also to show in parts of his work that were not so justly represented maybe for uh, art history. I think, the, you know, the, the whole academy thing has folded with, with the years. You know, it had a, a sort of lifespan of about 12, 13 years, and I think then various individual interests sort of went in other ways and so that it didn't really happen. So I, I kept the website going for as long as I could until, um, hmm. uh, as I was saying earlier... Uh, yeah, off camera, you were telling me that you were the webmaster for this uh, yep. site since yep. Windows 95 and it's still the same system. And, 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 and it, Exactly. And I, I haven't got a computer anymore, a reliable computer to continue updating that. <laughs> so I, I have to sort of find a, a, a meta website, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I know how to do now. I, 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 I'm working on that. Yeah. And Dieter Roth is certainly very important for your productions great, as an artist. No? Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a great meeting. Uh, I did quite a few things with him. I think when he died, I had four projects running with him. So, you know, none of which then happened, you know. So it hit you close, let's say, Chemicals, personally yeah. and artistically. That's right, yeah. Hmm. I, 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 had a, I was his chauffeur for, for 10 days in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> He invited, so fine. he invited me over because, you know, uh, being a serious drinker, he yeah. hadn't got a car license, you know. So so I was going around with this thing with 11 gears, I think, you know, it was extraordinary because you need them in Iceland, you know. And uh, we had a great time, yeah. Uh, intense. I mean, perhaps intense is more important than yeah. great, but it was great. <laughs> intense and great. <laughs> um, because there's a lot of uh, your, like, elements in your works um, I don't know if uh, lang language-wise you could say that I contest con constant la dialogue with his or with intention or tone or um, saying the um, uh, translation games of words for the jokes or saying the sausages. Um, What's up with this obsession with sausages? <laughs> Saus I, you know, I don't know, actually, because I think I'm not the first person to have had a thing with sausages. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I don't really do it. I think the, the, the thing with the sausage always interested me was that it was the, the, this example that I had that is there an inside to anything? And so if you take a sausage, you know, and you say, oh, yeah, the inside, you just have to cut it open, you know and you see what's inside. But you don't see what's inside because you've just got another surface. <laughs> and so that was, for me, the, that was the sausage. <laughs> it's a, a little bit of, it's a, you know, a, a mnemonic, right? It's, a, it's yeah. a little thing that I, yeah. I I use to sort of sort out my ideas. That's, some, that's a sausage and that's a, something or other, you know. Yeah, these uh, sausages from Dieter Roth were the literature wurst, which um, were <sighs> sausages filled with the same recipe. I think you will have the recipe also, some elements of conceptual art and so, but instead of meat, you will use the processed text, like the paper of the text, and in the cover of the sausage, you will have the cover of the uh, book. He took something. books by people he, he hated. Yeah. I can, I can imagine so it's like this it, process is and, like... And, and it's the German word he... he, he I had to verwurst it. He turned them into sausages. You know, it got. I love he, it. Yeah, it's great. And so he took Hegel, and he, <laughs> he got this. He got this great kind of wooden frame with every volume of the complete works. I don't know if it's complete works, but it was sort of one sausage after another. Each volume was of, a sausage. Of, you know, it was of Hegel. Of Hegel, yeah. And he got you know the the proper sort of skins. You know, from the sheep intestines or whatever they take pigs intestines, and he would actually put in sort of like. Um, onion and, and sage and, you know, herbs 
to make real sausage of, the, of them, but it was just mm. all paper. It was just the paper from the book. These are no longer uh, found materials like uh, you found when you were a kid, but no, they, he, these are organic materials, are materials that degrade during time. Well, this was, no, this was just books that he would uh, buy in a shop, I guess, you know, or... Uh, Yeah. But didn't were, weren't they not mixed with organic? They were energy? mixed with organic materials, but I think that kind of, they, they've survived very well. They've, they've not become... Because I read some stories about his uh, paintings, I think, with cheese and so, that uh, the um, curator had to throw them out in the desert. In California, and in the cheese race, yeah, that yeah. was just, a, uh, it must have been such a stench. And my first encounter with with Dieter Hort was actually when I was still a student of psychology, actually, and my girlfriend at that time was okay. a big fan of, of Dieter's. And so I went to the big exhibition at that time of books and prints at the Hayward Gallery. And you'd turn a corner and suddenly, you know, there would be framed salami slices <laughs> on, on a on a landscape, you know, stuff like this, and you just go, wow! <laughs> the, the stench was quite impressive. You thought that I dripped out? I just, that was great, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But in a way, you know, and, and I bought the catalogue, and in a way that was it for that moment. You know, for a long time I just sort of kept Dieter in the back of my mind. And I can't really recall when I actually found and bought the topography of Chance, which was the book by Daniel Sperry, where he looked at his work table and drew around everything that was on there, made a diagram, and then for each object told a very brief story, which was then elaborated on by Emmett Williams and then by Dieter, and then when we did it by us a little bit and had drawings by Topo, and it became the most fantastic artist book probably ever. It was a very, very wonderful production. So both me and Alastair had this idea of doing this book, you know, and so Alastair got in contact with Sperry and I got in contact with Dieter and Dieter sort of wrote me a stern letter saying, it's all up to the translation, it has to be good. Sort of, you know. <laughs> and, uh, But were you friends at the time? I didn't know him at all, no. no. I, I got the address for his address from Daniel Sperry and mm. wrote him this polite letter, you know. And, uh, and then we became friends and um, and he liked, he loved the translations, you know. So that was, uh, and I did more stuff for him later on translating for him. And he encouraged you on some uh, a series of works you did and so like the meta ones. Yeah, he, he, he got me my first exhibition actually, which was okay. at, at, at Bookie Wookie in, in Amsterdam. Now, I don't know if Bookie Wookie, you've heard of? I don't know. Ah, I tell you. Bookie Wookie is... I've never been in Amsterdam. <laughs> you've never been to Amsterdam, no. yeah, okay. You can visit it online. Bookie Wookie is the most wonderful artist bookshop probably in Europe. Okay. And you can find more or less everything there. You have to know where to look sometimes. <laughs> And it's run by an old, 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 or three old friends of Dieter's. So Dieter actually put money into the thing, and they also were involved with producing a lot of his copy books that he did later, mm -hmm. sort of bound books. That um, So they all worked together. It was a bit of a sort of a, a commune thing. He was a promoter in a way of uh, bookmaking as a form absolutely, of Absolutely, yes, absolutely. And, you know, he actually saw himself more as a, as a writer than an artist, which is for some people quite curious, you know. And so he had a... He, he was actually as he often did in Amsterdam, visiting them, and he suggested that they exhibit me. And But did he, uh, 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 had he seen something at the time from you? <laughs> He'd been to my home, so he must have seen stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he knew he knew my work a bit and uh, said, oh, this is good. And um, and then he bought a load of stuff, and um, which was very flattering, you know, and, yeah. and uh, told me how much I should charge for it. <laughs> <laughs> And so we had that exhibition, which was terrific, yeah. Uh, and there was, I mean, it, there was this whole thing that he wanted to do later on, um, a road show where people, his friends would sort of tour with him and, you know, they were all basically people with multiple talents. So he had, he had 
he would have had me as his translator, mm -hmm. but also as an artist, and then his carpenter friend who was also an artist, and we would sort of go to various places, and then then he died, you know. So, but it was it's a great shame. It would it would have been terrific, I think, you know. Is this aspect one of the aspects? This like he was promoting also like a multiple or multiplicity of experience, like traveling and so. Traveling was always very important to him. Absolutely, I mean, he had. On Iceland alone, three homes. Then he had uh, in Basel his big studio where he also slept and then a natural sort of home home. And then he had in Hamburg a place. So, I mean, he was he was always traveling. And like if he was visiting you, um, maybe he would sort of slip out of the door in the morning at six o'clock without saying goodbye, you know, because he would, he would then be moving on to the next place. That was yeah. just sort of how he would do it, you know. Hmm. So, um, and then, and that was actually how we decided to do, I mean, actually it wasn't perhaps my personal decision, but how the, the Dieter Roth Academy. Yes. Now that was set up primarily by his son Björn, who he had worked with very intensely over the years, and Jan from Bookie Wookie. Okay. So, um, yeah, the other two as well, uh, Hetty and and Rona as and 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 then basically it it involved all of these people who were all essentially in this this category of people who were friends of his. Mm. They were people with particular professional skills and were all artists. So you know, uh, and um, so the academy brought these people together, and the idea was to not actually have a building or a home. It wasn't the Dieterod Academy in Basel or in Reykjavik or something. It was where we were. It's so omnipresent. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with that. That's good, yeah, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, and so every every year we, we had a show in a different place. You know, we went to China, we went to uh, Hungary, we yeah. went to Germany, we went, you know, uh, yeah. uh, that, was, that, was the, that was the cool thing. And there are a lot of aspects or some aspects that uh, make him, for what I read, like a post avant-gardist, something like this. Uh, which ones do you think they are? Because I can tell, for example, this um, transdisciplinary attitude or this, the way of uh, relation, um, making a relation uh, with, in between art and life and how like, a special manifest or existential manifest of how to take this. But also the sound um, like working with sound and with literature, but with mixed art, you know, like all this. Yeah, he was multidisciplinary. Which definitely. of these yeah. elements are the key elements for considering him like a special figure in this new avant-gardist movement, like from the post-war, in a way? I would have thought the the um, essential key feature was this one thing he always said was, why not? Just do it. Try it. You heard it. Not so often, but often enough. I remember when he was over in London with us when we had a, a launch of the, the topography book. Um, my godson, who at that time was maybe 10 or something, you know, after three, four days with Dieter, he, he just sort of said, oh, Dieter wrote, why not? <laughs> but it was, it was this encouragement. This freshness. This ab way. And, and a freshness that, you know, the guy was sort of mid-60s at that point. I mean, and not in the best health, but... Um, but still quite vital. Hmm. Uh, and just telling people, you know, don't worry, just do it. See what happens, you know. And and hmm. and and if you do things, something else might happen. That, but that's the that's the important thing, you know, just to 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 make a start, get on with it, and and so on. Uh, and categories and so on. I mean, I think actually the defiance of categories, that defiance of making a body of work out of what you're doing, of spending 40 years doing the same sort of art so that you're a recognizable commodity hmm. is far removed from him. And I think that's a very important thing, even though you sort of, once you know his work well, you recognize it immediately. But hmm. it's, it's it has so many facets, but it's, yeah. It's not a work that is necessarily meant to be liked at the time. And maybe this is what makes it avant-gardist or new way. Or how that's right. Imagine. That's right. I remember, you know, stories like when he was in in Petersburg uh, Gallery in, in in Berlin. He he has table mats. He used to have table mats, which were the 
card that you use for book binding. You know, this sort of greyish mm -hmm. stuff, you know, and it's two, three millimetres thick. So it's fit. And he would just scribble on it, you know, and, and do stuff. And it produced wonderful artworks, you know. And But, I mean, like, in one day or maybe five weeks it would be there or other people would draw on it as well and so on. And, and he said, OK, well, now we'll sell them at Petersburg Gallery. And people said, you know, but, I mean, who's going to want that? And he said, just wait. They may not like them now, but the time will come. So right. he was very, very sure about that sort of stuff. He was an about the disruption he was creating. Yeah, he was because he knew obviously very well the structure or where this was coming, like uh, art history wise or institutional wise. So he know he knew what he was breaking in a way. That's right. Yeah, mm. or his personal ability to convince and and uh, yeah, and mm. he's done it. He did it. And I also find interesting um, uh, the relationship that this allows us to make between what's called concrete art, concrete music, concrete poetry, and so that mm -hmm. I think through Dieter Ross this is possible to uh, make, or at least for some things that I read fast today, uh, this is possible to make and listen to some of your works. I think I think some of this uh, heritage uh, prevails in a way. What do you think about? Well, it's it? interesting. Yeah, I, I would agree and disagree, and, and I would apply the same thing to myself. Um, certainly, I've done in my music um, things that are sort of like field recording and so on, which I think is the continuation from music concrete. Hmm. Um, and at the same time, then uh, obviously with with the the John Cage piece, the, the Electric Lady Land, I, I, I take a, a very concrete recording of a terrible um, what do you call this pin um, printer? These this awful noise from a, an Epson L40 or LX something? I think LX40. I have it uh, written down. I can tell it to you in a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's called a needle printer. Epson ninety dot matrix matrix printer. Matrix printer that's matrix what they're printer. called. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that uh, some people really love that. You know, that, that just this f four minutes thirty three seconds of printing out the actual score that John Cage wrote. Well, it was yeah, and, and was published. The one that is entitled. That is titled four minutes for four four hundred no thirty three seconds four ah, minutes okay. thirty three seconds yeah yeah and it's, it lasts exactly like the original. I work. tell you what, it's one page, and it's divided into three sections. I think by the word perset, which means pause, right? Handwritten in, in the Latin word, and so I scanned that and I printed it out on the printer, and I think it took about. Four minutes, ten seconds. Okay. And so I just slightly uh, lengthened the, the page, you know, in, in Microsoft Word until it was exactly four minutes, 33 seconds, and then I recorded the bugger, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and so that was it, you know. But where it, what, what happened then, obviously I sampled it and made a couple of symphonies and then I did a... An, I don't know if you've, you've heard that. Probably yeah, not. I've heard it. There's the, uh, the original one, which... Uh, it has the same duration as uh, John Cage's exactly, work. Yep, yep. That is, you hear just the printer printing the script of this work. Exactly, yep, right. yeah. It's and the most there, literal um, production yeah. you could do of that piece, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. because uh, Sven, our producer, was uh, I was talking uh, to him uh, before today in the kitchen, and he was like, but it's composed music, and talking about music concrete and stuff. And we were talking a bit about how Composition could still happen in a way, you know, even if you just record something acoustic, mm -hmm. because it's more about where you stand in the room. Or yeah, okay. And um, this work has a lot of elements, for example, from, yeah, you say, Ernst Thurston and Neubauten. Um, it has uh, that kind of aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah sure. uh, even though it may, be, it may be just a recording, the original. So offi one. office industrial. <laughs> right, but how can you differentiate? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, what sure, is this sure. more in industrial or concrete music or yeah, yeah, conceptual yeah. art? You know, who yeah, can, yeah. Yeah, who, yeah. who could ever say which one of those is more? You know, it's very difficult. 
That's why I like it as a work. Let's say, and that's why I guess a lot of people liked it too. Yeah, and what I was saying is okay. And then you have this sort of stuff from Dito with his recordings, his his music, where it's just sort of what is happening, what what they happen to be talking about him and uh, you know, Autofart is this one record, and it's just him and Bjorn, his son, talking in Icelandic while they're driving their jeep. You know, just what what happens to be. So it's complete like a. a document a field recording of their own selves, you know. But you always have this sort of ironic twist somewhere, whether it's in the cover or in, or in other pieces, you know. Right. And, which, and I, I would say, I would humbly say I have that same sort of thing when I take the John Cage te- uh, music and then make an a orchestral piece out of it by sampling it. And then at the end of it, there's a, a, a an extended disco remix of four minutes, 33 seconds. True. I couldn't listen to because I think I have to buy it. I will buy it, I promise. <laughs> I should have brought you a copy. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have. But to it, has, it has all this sort of stuff. Get on down. Or dun, 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 dun. Like just the title of it is already, I already understood <laughs> this uh, playful twist, let's the, say. The intention, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it has a very uh, funny title. Um, the special mix and so, and but I have to say uh, when I was I, I put I put play to the track without knowing what it was at the same time I was printing one of your PDFs, and then suddenly when I had two printers <laughs> at each side of my ear, I I was reading that this is the printer like oh, printing terrific. junk, so it was like a, uh, a very uh, an extend, nice, extended, um, funny moment. Yeah, great, great, great. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And uh, this relationship with uh, art, let's say, or with the art with the world, this playful approach, but at the same time having very serious objects of study, like uh, some topics of your drawings, of your paintings, and so um, you mix a lot of this kind of naive, caricaturesque uh, style but uh, with ref- very heavy educated references to literature geopolitics or uh, physics or so mm. um, how do you live this relationship between the art and the world in a way and do you think it, for you today is the same as if when it, as it, uh, how it was before or do you think this should have a transformation in a way. I mean, when you say transformation, do you think... I'm being very abstract, sorry. Yeah, okay. I, well, <laughs> I, I will in, I'll give an interpretation of what I think you're saying um, by saying perhaps you mean that times are getting so shitty that we should actually give up <laughs> all this speculative nonsense and, I don't and know. funny drawings <laughs> just ask. And, and, and get on the streets and, and lie down in front of cars, you know. <laughs> Which is perhaps it's what it's going to have to come down to at some point, you know. Who knows? Yeah. Um, I think on the one hand, I see myself as a humorist, and I think uh, there's a a great need always of humour. Absolutely. And I think I serve a f- perhaps a fairly small audience because it does make sense that you have some idea of what I'm talking about. Although I think sometimes obscurity in itself can be an interesting sort of colour, you know. It's just sort of, <laughs> just think, oh, what's, what's that? And, and 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 maybe it hangs in a person's mind because they don't quite understand it. And then at some other point, something will happen, a little coincidence. Maybe, you know. I mean, I don't necessarily see myself as offering enormous great insights or answers or anything. You are, though. Yeah? It, the, the thing is, it might be targeted to certain... Um, spectator with certain uh, references already acquired. Yeah. Uh, not in the totality of it, you know, but this might be the limit in that regard. Uh, but it does offer lots of insights and there's a lot of uh, content in that way, you know. Good, okay. Mm. Um, well, that's good to hear. Mm. That's the dichotomy it has in a way. We talk about it off camera. Uh, because at one side you are making it available by the style, by the simplicity of it sometimes, uh, and at the same time it still carries this content, you know, Good. and all these references and so, which is like this um, gesture mm. your work, I think, uh, mm. has. Mm. Um, and there's the tension in a way also, you know. But this uh, 
paintings uh, can be also very liberating. You know, you can laugh a lot or um, maybe you also want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, d d name one painting where you want to cry. Well, since you have a psychological, you know, you know which... <laughs> which, <laughs> which buttons to which press, buttons yeah. Which buttons to press, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you see, a lot of a lot of those ideas they just come very very spontaneously. People tend to sort of think, you know, ah, oh, yeah, it's an il illustrative art that I'm doing, that I'm illustrating ideas. But it's actually very often the other way around, that I'll sit and just sort of, you know, like an, you know, I'll sort of start drawing something, and it becomes a face, it becomes, an, and then I think, ah, and I put a title to it. And that's where the moment, it, that's where it becomes alive. But it's become alive because of that drawing was already there. And it's that way around generally, not always. Hmm. And um, and they're often very, you know, they're like little sort of key, key marks. It's like that thing I was saying with the sausage. The sausage hmm. plays a particular role in my way of thinking when I write notes for myself about this thing. And maybe uh, some of these things that I do in my... My books are also of that kind, you know. They they hmm. um, they create certain sort of landmarks in my thinking hmm. that you can I can sort of come back to and think, okay, that that's been established there, and then I can carry on in a different direction. I, uh, there was one that I saw today that it said, "Is reality is really as absurd than uh, uh, isn't this?" Painting uh, mimesis. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, <laughs> 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 what is it? I can't remember. It's that, it's that one with that round ball in it, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Right, but yeah. this kind of, you yeah. know. Well, that, like that's, that was a case in point. And what a shame that we neither of us can remember <laughs> what it was. Because there's often um, a tendency in my work to undermine the, th the picture that you're seeing, hmm. you know. So, you know, there's it's not just that text and, and visual image conflict or compete, but they kind of manage to annul each other. So the whole thing just vanishes. Yeah. And that happens in that particular painting. And damn it, um, I don't know if you can do some post-production and put that, f flash that in or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really love this kind of thought experiment effect, you know, that yeah. you can have with this... Um, a playful compositions, let's say, that as I said before, the challenge that uh, they can achieve is something very diff difficult because it's um, taking the form of a very simplistic sometimes style that makes it available at the same time still containing a lot of the heaviness of the references, you know, and that's why I like the gesture in a way. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We will put some links for everything I'm talking about in the description. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of you'll see. You know, like sometimes I think it's sort of embarrassing, but you know, I, I did a, a book recently. I think it's sixty nine thoughts of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's just actually sort of I th each one a thought with a drawing, and if you go through it, every drawing is in a different style. You know, so. I sometimes am completely amazed. I suddenly would be drawing in a style that I didn't didn't recognise from myself, and um, I think I'm fairly fairly hard put to. I have done books which have been completely sort of like sixty pages of just one style, but yeah, I, I tend to sort of ramble in lots of different directions. You know, it's sort of. But like my ideas, they ramble in lots of different directions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And with drawing, there's a lot the surrealists, there's a lot psychology from the 20th century, um, knew how to use from the process of drawing to get to parts of interpret or interpretations of the psyche and so. So there, there was a constant, let's say, uh, element that were dialoguing even with avant-garde movements or with psychology in a way. Well, I, mean, I think the sur surrealists... In that way, it doesn't surprise me. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, the surrealists, are obviously, you know, Atlas Press has done a lot on uh, of books, uh, from, uh, above all, sort of Breton and um, yeah. his various companions, um, books of, of on 
surrealism. No, not on surrealism. By surrealists. Yeah. Be, be, be very clear. Yeah. <laughs> and the surrealists actually kept the whole idea of drawing as an art form very high. I think that's amazing. It's, it's, it's interesting when you think back, actually, the last sort of hundred years, where were the, the great sort of drawers, people who could draw? You find people like Kirchner in, in, in the Expressionist and some, some wonderful, yeah. wonderful people I like back it. then. Yeah, exactly. It's terrific stuff. It basically, I mean, my heart always sort of leap, uh, leaps a beat when I see good drawing, you know, and, hmm. and also good painting, I must say. But, but, then but it is post, let's say, a figurative or um, trying to represent reality in traditional ways. This is already, I mean, expressionism is already trying to take different aspects of reality that are not yeah. what they used to be traditionally. Yeah. So do you have like this kind of phobies and stuff, like playing with the colors or enhancing yeah. the perception more? Yeah, the, mm. yeah, or, or doing completely mad stuff, you know. And I mean, I think uh, the, the I was going to say the surrealists, you know, people mm. like Yves Tanguy, he, the little drawings that he did for, for the the um, Mad Balls uh, by oh god, what's his name? Perrick, Benjamin Perrick, wonderful sort of completely obscene drawings, but beautiful sort of uh, work. Andre Masson, fabulous. Uh, craftsman, Belmer, you know, already perfected in a way his technique before he joined the Surrealists, but uh, what an exponent. Yeah, this is, it's something I, I found. And then the whole Belgian wing, I don't know if you know, these sorts of guys, uh, with Paul Colline and, and people like that, and, and also obviously um, Magritte did a lot of drawing yeah. as well, you know. Very fine, beautiful line drawings and witty and and perfect vehicles for this kind of hmm. um, a life between craziness and reality between exactly and ways to yeah. finding gateways to the subconscious. I think I think exactly this was parallel for gateways even to for psychology yeah. than uh, for the surrealists. They yeah. were both using it with the same objective in different ways. Let's yeah. say. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, this is terrific. There's uh, this game uh, we were playing in primary school, uh, Cadaver... Uh, exquisite Corpse, yeah? yeah. yeah exquisite yeah. Corpse. In English, In, in yeah, Spanish, yeah. it's Cadaver Exquisito. Yeah. Which uh, you fold the paper and each one dra draws part of the paper and then you have this... Uh, you form a, f a person, a figure, yeah. yeah. And Terrific. Yeah. Then much later, I learned that this was, or is related at least, they say, to the surrealist, uh, one of these uh, kind of games in a way that related psychology with perception, games, and so on. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether the surrealists invented it. I think it was already probably around. This is a, uh, uh, this is a theor rumor, theor theoretical rumor. Yeah, they yeah, say yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I, I have no idea, but it doesn't matter really. But. Um, Hmm. Either way. And this uh, is interesting because this is something that came back um, to the new vanguard from the, after the war. Uh, even more stronger that has to do with challenge the figure of the author in a way. Like the, um, uh, ha, uh, including the work of several people that work in sure. war, One sure. Piece. And, sure, sure hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, And I mean, Dieter wrote very, very clear, uh, always tried to work with other people. I mean, actually, he had two sides. The one was the sort of the hermetic individual, hmm. generally when he was trying out or getting over a hangover, either when he was getting over a hangover or when he was spending, <laughs> spending weeks in Iceland not drinking. You know, yeah. he, would, he would work very much on his own. But in other yeah. situations, you know, all these great collaborations with, with Richard Hamilton, with uh, Anof, Rainer and, and all these, yeah. And uh, it was this idea in a way, and I think he actually phrased it more or less in these words that you could do it like a like a combo, like a jazz band or something, you know, like more several, yeah. you know. Actually, jazz was a, a chosen metaphor for talking about the new art for a lot of philosophers. Yeah, so. yeah. 
saying uh, Adorno, for example. <laughs> Except Adorno. <laughs> I know Adorno. Yeah? Yeah, Adorno was playing uh, actually free jazz. Ah, was he? It's very, in- it's very interesting because for how he talks about it, it doesn't look like it, like in statics and stuff. I'm amazed by this, actually. I thought I thought it was complete. Yeah, a friend of mine told me. I will research it, but um, okay. mostly sure. Okay. Otherwise, I cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot be wrong about Adorno. <laughs> like, they will cancel me in all uh, uh, okay. RT okay. circles. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. So but to, but also yeah. yeah but I mean you have all these sorts of areas don't you? you have you know the artwork which decomposes because of it's it's part of life you know yeah. it, um, you do an artwork which is done with several people together um, it's all these sort of areas of I, I mean I'm suspicious of this sort of combining art and life you know that boundary because you know art, every artist has their own private yeah. life and stuff it just it's just too se- true. it's yeah. too sensationalist uh, as as a term really yeah. but it, you know it's sort of that one piece doesn't just exist on its own in isolation except in a in a museum hmm. on a wall it's it's part of all sorts of things hmm. and uh, this white white cube situation. yeah that's right yeah the white yeah. cube or, or yeah yeah hmm. But these aspects of challenging authorship and these aspects of co-creation, they came back strongly with digital art, especially in the last years or yeah, decade. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because working with computers or assistance intelligence or artificial intelligence mm-hmm. started to be called co-creation, for example. And yeah, sure. um, these concepts of authorship... Um, uh, became very actual again, like Walter Benjamin and so, uh, when uh, last year, a couple of years ago, this new crypto art appeared. That yeah, is a way yeah, of yeah, yeah. making one copy of something digital unique, you know? So this was something that we were studying for decades, that it was already happened, that the end of uniqueness... But you this know, is, this is st- it's a step backwards then. In a way, it is. I think so, and I think it's a it's a strange thing because in a way it is. because you know the the uh, energy is required to keep these artworks. It has one good thing that is that this artist that was for decades doing cheap things for companies mm-hmm. and now he's able to earn a lot for one single digital file. Sure, of course. This is the good outcome, let's say. Yeah. But the other one is like this in one. It's also a retrograde one, you know. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen too much of this stuff, and what I've seen hasn't impressed me too. It doesn't have to... Way. Yeah, this I, I, I asked a lot of guests about it. Even mm. some of them make a crypto I, art. I'm, I'm doing crypto art, yeah. I still don't get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a journey to finally get it, <laughs> because it's not about... It's more about the instance of his production and the contest, the social improvement of the author, than the visual aspect or the aesthetic uh, aspect, you know, it's yeah. very, it's interesting. Uh, actually. It's, it's interesting because a friend of mine who sadly died in a motor ac- accident, a cycle, motorcycle accident, uh, actually al- already 20 years ago, so he must have, shortly beforehand, was already trying to do online art in a, in a this sort of way. Hmm. It, it just, you know, he didn't, have that kind of thing. Obviously, crypto art follows on from from the the famous uh, paper on cryptocurrency and that sort of thing, isn't it? You know, and, and what do they call it? Block dinging, blockchain, blockchain stuff. Yeah, exactly. So none of that existed when he was trying to do it. Right. And he poured all of his money, all of his, uh, you know, he inherited, and he tried and tried and tried to get internet platform, an internet way of doing art. Hmm. It never worked, but uh, this idea is, uh, uh, I just hold a candle up to him. <laughs> Wolfgang Dopp, he deserved it to see it happen in a way, yeah. He did deserve to see it happen, he was a great guy. Mm. And what do you think about all of this? I mean, you see like the devil's mark on it, like uh, this technology based new uh, authorship <laughs> possibility of digital art. Do you think this is a sign of something definitely going wrong, or you think there's some kind of Hope in it. I don't see any particular hope in it. I just think it's a new tw- twist in in the, in the spiral. Um, hmm. I don't know that authorship in that respect will be changed because, uh, as I see it, um, authorship was just basically turning the lamp onto the the 
recipient. Hmm. Um, and to a, a, a very sort of basic fact, actually, that had long been overlooked, that I listen to a piece of music by um, somebody and I, I drift away and I, I start listening to other things in my brain because I, I start correcting it or or humming along to it to a different counter melody or something yeah. like that. We all do this, I think. You know, it's the same sort of thing that uh, da Vinci said, you know, he, he would look at piss stains on the wall and see faces in them or we see faces in clouds, you know. It's a normal tendency and I think that is actually already the, the counter author, you know. Yeah. We, it's there. It's always been there. I like da Vinci was one of these first multi-artists in a way. Um, fabulous, yeah. fabulous. Yeah. So we have to start wrapping up. Okay. And uh, uh, for <laughs> you have a, <laughs> a a personal feeling on how this will go in general. Like saying, in the situation we are right now, we experience, for example, that art and culture can be in a way put uh, or. Uh, let's say, reduce the access to it for the general public. And we had a lot, like two years of it and so. Uh, here in Germany, there was a lot of um, movements at the first stages where everything was closed and now it's a bit better. But uh, if I had to ask you, like outside the art production and the art world, do you think this is uh, something we should see with optimism? optimism or um, some of your position of where this is going is, is not looking it so optimistic or what do you we're just seeing so many changes at, at the moment we're seeing a big the disappearance actually of middle and small galleries I mean, they come and go, but... I for mean, decades now. For decades now, and all being sort of sucked up into the, the, the big five and apart, a, a couple of others. Um, and then they are obviously manipulating the big galleries, the big museums as well. Hmm. Uh, you know, when you just go and s go to... Uh, I won't name any, name any names. <laughs> 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 but you see an exhibition put on by a major museum yeah. in a major town in Germany, and you just think, why? <laughs> why is this third-rate artist on there? But presumably because there's a lot of money being sort of put in there from wherever. China, the Middle East, probably. Yeah, and, and, and via the galleries, you know, the big, the big galleries. Hmm. So it's, it's a very frustrating situation. Hmm. And, and uh, I think we just have to hope that Initiatives there are, I think, great initiatives that I see. Small, small, small micro places will become more important. I think hmm. it's a, a, a di diversi di diversifying and yeah, and diversifying in, in all sorts of ways, not in under the capital D diversity, I guess, which is also important. Hmm. But um, yeah, new ways of relating, let's say, and uh, making new. Uh, endeavors in, with a different thinking that is not just individualistic or capitalist. I think this is well, this is certainly what we try to do actually with the the Dieter Watt Academy, and, and um, as I say, it, it actually, particularly capital, started to play a role, and I think that's hmm. what we're, where why it went amiss in the end. But um, yeah, uh, if you want to have more information on Malcolm's uh, artworks, music, and books. We will leave some links under the video in the description. Malcolm, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Pablo, all the best. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to give us a like and a comment under the video. If you want to see more, click here, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel.